Anatoly Unitsky's article Spaceway Program as the only possible scenario to save the earthly technocratic civilization from extinction and death, performed by Michael Kirichenko. The humankind has no experience in the industrial development of the near-Earth space. Now, what should the space industry be like? What are its functions, volumes and types of products to be produced? Where will these products be mainly consumed? In space or on the Earth? There could be asked a lot of questions. And people could not give clear answers today. Any answer can be right and wrong at the same time. Everything will depend on those particular ways of development to be selected by the Earth's civilization in the future, during the large-scale space exploration. In fact, such objective reasons as the environmental restrictions, destruction and degradation of the living fertile soils, exhaustion of the Earth's raw materials, energy, spatial and other resources, the threat of the atmosphere overheating and the global adverse climate change, etc., should almost entirely move the material production sphere to the near space in the future. At the same time, the humankind, as a biological species, like any other species of living organisms on our planet, is the product of 4 billion years evolution in the unique and special terrestrial conditions. We ideally fit the Earth's gravity, the magnetic and electric fields of the Earth, air saturated with phytoncides from the flowering plants, the spring water containing the trace elements we need, life-giving foods grown on fertile soil, which is the immune system of the terrestrial biosphere, and still many other things we don't even suspect, but without which we cannot exist not only today, but also in the foreseeable future. Nowhere in the immense universe, including the Moon and Mars, there can be no more suitable conditions for us, the Earthlings, than on our beautiful blue planet. Therefore, the main consumer of the future space industry products will be located on the Earth. Space industrialization means creation on the orbit of the conditions for production of various materials energy, equipment, obtaining new information, carrying out technological processes, conducting scientific experiments. Therefore, a significant freight traffic is inevitable between the consumer of the material products, the humanity living on the Earth, and the production of these products placed on the near-Earth orbit. Since a person is primarily material, his consumption of the products for his own life necessities food, water, air, etc., and of the industrial goods rising the comfort level of his existence – telephone, computer, TV, refrigerator, car, etc. – depends on his ergonomics. It is geocosmic cargo traffic that will determine the pace of development of the space industry for the benefit of the Earth's civilization living in their home on the planet Earth, amounting to about 10 billion people by that time. It's like an industrial umbilical cord, connecting a growing child with a mother. Its cross-section will determine the metabolism, energy and growth rate of the child. The mouse has a thin umbilical cord, it is thicker in a man and even more thick in an elephant. Consequently, the annual per capita consumption of the industrial products in the future should be commensurate with the mass of a person. Thus. For 10 billion people, it is at least 100 million tons per one year, or 10 kilograms per one person on the planet. That is why the bottleneck of the future space industrialization, when the Earth's civilization could turn into a truly space civilization, will be the transport on the root planet near space planet. Even in the most daring forecasts, such well-known geocosmic transport systems as carrier rockets, space elevator, electromagnetic gun, etc., are capable of transporting only a few thousand tons of cargo per year, or less than one gram of space production per an inhabitant of the planet, which is four times less than required. If we were a civilization of micro-lilliputs and weight within one gram, 
Such transportation capacity would suit us perfectly. However, it is unacceptable for the technocratic civilization of the Earth type, which smelts today about 2 billion tons per year of only the basic metals – iron, copper and aluminium. If solutions to this problem are not found in the nearest future, our Earth's technocratic civilization will face the fate of the mold in the Petri dish. It will die after having eaten all the limited resources and having poisoned the limited space with its waste products. The analysis shows that only two generations remain until the point of no return, when the industrial technosphere created by a man finally wins, that is, finally kills the Earth's biosphere. Today, and in the foreseeable future, the geocosmic transportation will be very expensive, at least 1 million US dollars per ton, taking into account the capital and operating costs in the most ambitious forecasts. Therefore, to implement the space industrialization program, if we rely on the existing and prospective geocosmic transport systems, an annual budget of at least 100 trillion US dollars will be required, which is unjustified and simply insane cost for the humanity significantly exceeding the today's global GDP. These costs are actually aimed at the civilization's suicide, since almost 100% of funds will be spent on creating the tools for the large-scale destruction of the biosphere by the geocosmic transport system, which is especially evident on the example of launch vehicles, including the promising ones. The environmental harm of the rockets is worth mentioning separately, since it is the rocket vector of space industrialization and exploration of the Moon and Mars that is considered the most priority by the experts today. Although the rockets, along with the ozone holes, create ionospheric holes with a stream of high-energy particles directed to the surface of the planet, cause turbulence in the upper atmosphere provoke powerful atmospheric cyclones, drastically reduce the atmospheric pressure at the surface of the Earth, etc., we will consider only one special question – the destruction of the ozone layer. Back in the early 80s of the last century, there was evidence that more than 60% of ozone in the ozone layer of the planet was destroyed in the process of rocket launches. A shuttle of the shuttle type in one launch depending on the ionospheric conditions, can destroy from 10 to 40 million tons of ozone, not only because it uses ozone extinguishing elements as fuel, nitrogen, chlorine, etc., but also because the plasma of a jet stream has a temperature of about 4000 degrees centigrade, almost three times the steel melting temperature, and an outflow speed of about 4 kilometers per second five times higher than the speed of a sniper rifle bullet. Thus, almost all the energy from the burning fuel in a jet engine is released into the atmosphere, and only a small part of it is spent on useful work, to lift the cargo to the height of the orbit and its acceleration to the orbital speed, the first space one for this orbit. In addition to those zone quenching, the rocket launchers also change the physical chemistry of the upper atmosphere, cause turbulence in the ionosphere and even affect the geomagnetic field in the launch pitch plane. It is difficult to determine the complex economic damage caused to the planetary ecosystem through the traditional rocket space exploration. But a private assessment of damage only from destruction of the ozone layer of the planet can be performed. If the cost of ozone recovery is estimated not as natural, supposedly free and gratuitous, but as the technogenic methods. It is common knowledge that ozone is produced by passing air or oxygen through an ozonizer. The main factor contributing to the cost of the ozone production is electricity consumption. The best industrial ozonizers consume about 10 kilowatt hours of energy to produce 1 kilogram of ozone. With an average world cost of electricity of about 0.1 US dollars per kilowatt hour, the cost of electricity consumed to obtain one ton of ozone will be approximately 1,000 US dollars. In fact, these costs will be significantly higher 
considering the cost of equipment and the overhead costs. Thus, in order to restore the ozone destroyed at each launch of the heavy rocket, in the amount of more than 10 million tons, only the electric energy to be spent will cost 10 billion US dollars. Even if each rocket puts 100 tons of cargo into the orbit, there are currently no such launch vehicles on the market. The environmental damage of at least 100 million US dollars will be incurred per one ton of payload. Consequently, the minimum environmental tax on development of the near-Earth space using the launch vehicles should be at least 100 million US dollars for each ton of output cargo. And no prospective reduction in the cost of launching rockets can reduce the cost of moving a ton of cargo into the orbit below 100 million US dollars. The harm that will be even more sensible in the future, which rockets bring to our common home, the planet's biosphere. No less important is the location of the future extraterrestrial industry. It should be as close as possible to the consumer. That is, to the surface of the planet, where billions of people will live. Since the industry will include a huge number of components, factories, technological platforms, power plants, residential modules, etc., the orbits of their movement should not intersect. Otherwise, given the very high cosmic movement speeds, a destructive chain reaction of the entire system, the domino principle, may occur, which will cause death of thousands, if not millions, of people serving the space industry. Avoidance of such a catastrophe, which probability is not equal to zero, even with the most advanced control system, can only be reached by locating the space industry in the equatorial plane of the planet. In case of such location of the circular orbits, the velocity vectors of the cosmic bodies, being at an arbitrary time on the same vertical, are parallel to each other, regardless of the height of the orbit. In this case, the difference in absolute speeds of movement in the neighboring orbits is the smaller, the closer they are to each other. Therefore, here we can talk not about the possibility of collisions of the vehicles, for example, in case of emergency, but about their contacting each other. It will also make it quite easy to move from orbit to orbit and exchange the raw materials, materials, energy and products produced in the space between the neighboring orbits. Thus, the principle of exploration of the near-Earth space in the future in the equatorial plane differs significantly from the today's space exploration. Where the orbits of the artificial Earth satellites and orbital stations are arbitrary and intersect each other. Thus, the principle of exploration of the near-Earth space in the future in the equatorial plane differs significantly from the today's space exploration where the orbits of the artificial Earth satellites and orbital stations are arbitrary and intersect each other. We are located on the planet in a gravitational potential well from which we can get out, either by rising to the infinity or by flying out of it with the first cosmic velocity, equal to 7,919 meters per second, and not vertically up, by going to a circular orbit. Therefore, for each ton of cargo delivered into the orbit, it is necessary to bring at least 8.7 thousand kilowatt hours of energy if you use the electrical energy generated by a thermal power plant. It will be equivalent to consumption of about 2.2 tons of fuel. Due to this reason, the geocosmic transport is very energy intensive and should have an efficiency as close as possible to 100% in order to avoid the global environmental problems. For example, a carrier rocket spends 20 times more fuel than it is required by the laws of physics, since almost all of its energy is not supplied to the cargo, but is emitted into the atmosphere. And taking into account the pre-flight, obtaining the fuel components, their cooling to cryogenic temperatures, etc., and flight costs, as well as the energy losses, the aerodynamic resistance, loss of lower stages and fairings, which manufacture consumes a huge amount of energy, etc. The overall energy efficiency of the launch vehicle is significantly worse than that of a steam locomotive, 
about 1%. When the cargo returns from the space to the Earth, the space vehicle is decelerated by the atmosphere. Thus, all their potential and kinetic energy is released into the environment in the form of high-temperature plasma wake, burning out the heat shielding envelope, acoustic waves, increasing the environmental damage caused during the initial geocosmic logistics when delivering the cargo to the space. We do not know how technology will develop in the future, including the space technology, since we are not aware of the upcoming discoveries. The only thing we can state with complete confidence is that, whatever the technique may be, it will comply with the fundamental laws of nature. Such laws, repeatedly tested in practice, will remain fair at all times. In the field of mechanics they include four conservation laws, to which all other particular cases of conservation laws can be reduced – energy, momentum, angular momentum and movement of the centroidal motion of the system. In addition to the kinetic and potential energies to the space cargo, you must also bring the momentum and the angular momentum for rotation in orbit around the planet. Since the near-Earth space industry should be created from the planet, according to the conservation laws, both excess energy equal to 100% minus the efficiency of geocosmic transport and the reverse impulse, like the recoil from a gun when fired, and the angular momentum, like the moment transmitted on the helicopter case from a rotating screw, should be transmitted to the planet. A rocket, for example, transmits this all to the planet not directly, but through an intermediary, represented by the atmosphere, throwing combustion products into it at a speed of about 4000 meters per second, and with a temperature of about 4000 degrees centigrade in its most vulnerable part, in the ozone layer and in the ionosphere. This causes turbulence, atmospheric and ionospheric vortices, and each time a rocket is launched, it leads to formation of ozone and ionospheric holes equal to the size of the territory of France. Many flaws of the rocket are caused not only by the ultra-high temperatures and jet flow rate, but also by their required ultra-high engine power, about 1 million kilowatts per ton of cargo. Imagine, for example, how much would a regular passenger car with an engine not with the power of 100 kilowatts, but 1 million kilowatt cost? Imagine, for example, how much would a regular passenger car with an engine not with the power of 100 kilowatts, but 1 million kilowatts cost? But the power of jet engines and acceleration, 30 to 50 meters per square second and more, could be significantly reduced to 1 1.5 meters per square second, which is acceptable for an ordinary passenger as well as in the traditional land transport. If it were possible to increase the effective operation period from 4-6 minutes to 120-150 minutes. However, this unfortunately cannot be done, because according to the laws of physics, the jet thrust would decrease, with a decrease in the intensity of fuel burning, which during the flight should always exceed the starting weight. Thus, all rocket fuel would burn and the rocket would stand on the starting table without even moving. Thus, the basic conditions and requirements for space industrialization and geocosmic transport are as follows. The space industry should be placed in low circular orbits in the equatorial plane. The geocosmic transport should be designed not as a fixed structure, but as an aircraft. The geocosmic transport should be as environmentally friendly, self-supporting, the principle of Baron Münchhausen, working only on the internal forces of the system, without any mechanical and energy interaction with the environment in the process of geocosmic transportation. The theoretical efficiency of geocosmic transport should be close to 100%. Ensuring cargo flows to the extent of the millions and in the future the billions of tons of cargo per year. The possibility to recover potential and kinetic excess energy of the space products during their delivery from space to Earth. The use of clean energy to enter the space, electric energy. The geocosmic transport in the process of geocosmic transportation should transmit momentum, angular momentum and energy, 
directly to the solid Earth's crust, without including the planet's atmosphere in the mechanical chain. The power of the geocosmic transport engine in terms of one ton of cargo should be relatively low, not more than 100 kilowatts as in a passenger electric car. Acceleration boost for passengers and cargo should be comfortable and should not exceed 1.5 meter per square second, for which purpose the time to go into orbit and obtain the first space velocity should be at least 2 hours. All the above 10 basic requirements are met by only one engineering solution, which is the General Planetary Vehicle GPV, which is a self-supporting aircraft covering the planet in the equatorial plane. The peculiarity of the GPV operation is that the spacewalk is carried out by increasing the diameter of its ring by 1.57% when lifting every 100 km and reaching at the calculated height with passengers and cargo the peripheral velocity of the body equal to the first space velocity. At the same time, the position of the center of mass of the GPV does not change in the process of going into space it always coincides with the center of mass of the planet. Therefore, the regular movement, rising to a height and receiving the first space velocity at a given height, can be carried out only by the internal forces of the system, without any significant interaction with the environment. The optimal interval driving force for GPV is the excessive centrifugal force from a belt flywheel, accelerated in a vacuum channel, using a linear motor and a magnetic cushion to speeds exceeding the first space velocity up to 10 to 12 km per second, depending on the ratio of the linear masses of the body and flywheel. This is not a very high speed. It is thousands times lower, for example, than the speed approaching 300,000 km per second obtained on the same principles in the modern charged particles accelerators. For transfer of the momentum and angular momentum to the body of the GPV when entering the orbit in order to obtain an orbital velocity equal to the first space velocity at a given height, a second belt flywheel is needed. Then, when breaking the first belt flywheel, its excess kinetic energy, since the linear electric motor will be operating in the generator mode, will not be possible to discharge it into the environment but to recover for acceleration in the opposite direction of the second flywheel. When a double pulse is received from acceleration of one and braking of the other flywheel, the maximum efficiency and maximum overall efficiency of the GPV will be achieved when rising to the orbit and when the body, with passengers and cargo, receives a peripheral speed equal to the first space velocity. Thus, from the standpoint of physics, the most environmentally friendly geocosmic aircraft, using only its internal forces to enter space, has only one variant. Three ring structures covering the planet in the equatorial plane with the center of mass coinciding with the center of mass of the Earth. Ring structures have the ability to rotate around the planet and relative to each other with speeds exceeding the first space velocity. Ring structures have the ability to lengthen with increasing diameter in the process of going into orbit. Ring structures have linear actuators along their length, capable of accelerating and braking them relative to each other. Thus, the GPV is a reusable geocosmic transport complex for non-rocket development of the near space. The GPV will allow putting into the orbit within one flight about 10 million tons of cargo. 250 kilograms per one meter of the GPV body length, and 10 million passengers, 250 people per one kilometer of the body length, which will be involved in creation and operation of the near-Earth space industry. Within one year, the GPV will be able to go into space up to 100 times. It will take the modern world rocket and space industry, in which trillions of dollars have already been invested, about a million years to achieve what a GPV can do within one year. At the same time, the cost of delivering each ton of payload to the orbit will be thousands times lower than that of the modern launch vehicles, less than 1,000 US dollars per ton. The environmentally friendly GPV, operating exclusively on electric energy, will allow realizing industrialization of the near space.
To do this, it will be necessary to close all the industrial production that is harmful to the Earth's biosphere on the planet, creating them again in the near-Earth orbit on new principles that are environmentally friendly for the space. This step will open access to fundamentally new industrial technologies through the use of unique space capabilities not available on the Earth. Weightlessness, high vacuum, ultra-low and ultra-high temperatures, inexhaustible sources of energy and resources, including mineral and spatial ones. Big opportunities are opening up in the field of information and energy communications. Bringing the industry out of the planet will radically improve our common living environment, our common home, the biosphere of the planet Earth, especially in the industrialized regions, without any restrictions on production growth. Almost all engineering solutions used in the project are widely known, tested in practice and are currently implemented in the industry. The project budget will be about 2.5 trillion US dollars. This is not that much, given the annual military budget of the United States today is almost 700 billion US dollars. At the same time, the technological base for construction of the launch flyover will be the Skyway systems, which will make it possible to make profit from the project at the initial stages of its implementation by transporting passengers and cargo on the surface of the planet. Humanity has all the opportunities for implementation of the most ambitious project in the entire history of civilization. For example, about 100 million tons of metal, today the same amount of steel is smelted on the planet in less than three weeks, and about 10 million cubic meters of reinforced concrete. Approximately the same amount of concrete is laid in a single dam of the Sayana Shushanskaya hydro power plant. Implementation of the GPV project into the world power grid means about 1 million kilowatts, 2.5 kilowatts per linear meter of length, or 10 kilowatts per one ton of cargo, which is less than 2% of the installed net power of power plants in the world and is equal to the power of one launch vehicle, capable to lift into the space less than 100 tons with one flight, and not 10 million tons of cargo like the GPV. The linear city with millions of workplaces built along the GPV flyover, including across the oceans with such skyway transport and infrastructure complexes as urban, up to 150 km per hour, high speed, up to 500 km per hour and hyperspeed up to 1,250 km per hour will allow the commercialization of the Spaceway program to begin even before the terrestrial industry is put into space. String roads today are able to earn money. People can build residence and develop business around them. The new environmentally friendly transport will make life even more attractive in the area of transport accessibility. The string transport and infrastructure complexes will give an impulse to the development of their previously undeveloped lands. Thanks to the Skyway flyovers, the lines of modern information communications, electricity, water supply and fertile soil, and later on the space production, will reach the most remote corners of the planet. Life will appear around them and the deserts will gradually disappear from the surface of the planet. Accommodation in the mountains and on the sea shelf will be more prestigious than, for example, the one in New York or Paris. The human and nature will finally be in harmony with each other. Besides this, the research and development work on the GPV will be carried out, which will require about 5% of the total project investment. Generally, it will take at least a couple of decades to solve all the engineering problems. Despite the fact that the work has been going on for many decades, the implementation of this large-scale project is hardly possible only using the efforts of the team created by the engineer and author of the GPV, Anatoly Yunitsky, more than 30 years ago. We believe that such global geocosmic program, with common goals and objectives, will unite all countries of the world, will attract them to finance this super-ambitious project designed to save the humanity. 
Due to its technical features, the project will directly affect the territory of dozens of countries, mainly located along the equator. And due to the political and economic reasons, the whole world. The GPV and the industrial necklace around the Earth will become an indispensable platform for advanced exploration of the deep space by reusable space vehicles and a security circuit to prevent the space threats, including the meteoritic ones. The project implementation period will take about 20 years, taking into account the socio-political, research, development, design, survey, construction and installation works. The world around us was created by the engineers, not the bankers, not the politicians, not the artists, but the engineers. However, this world is often ruled by those other people, for whom personal enrichment is at the forefront. Those who naively believe that in the situation where the planet will be on the verge of destruction, money will be able to save them. They are sure that they and their families will be able to find shelter on their personal islands, in underground bunkers, on submarines and Boeings with anti-missile defense system. How wrong they are! The planet is a one big room that does not even have partitions. Many centuries ago, the primitive people and their leaders burned fires in their caves and died of lung cancer at the age of 20. They were able to survive only due to the fact that they had guessed to move their primitive technologies, ordinary fire, beyond their home. So now we, the terrestrial civilization, should bring the technosphere outside of our home, the biosphere. All engineering solutions for this step, ensuring transition of humanity to a new stage of civilizational development, have already been created. There is no doubt that during implementation of the General Planetary Vehicle project, it will be necessary to cope with a large number of problems and difficulties both in a technical and social way. However, they are insignificant in comparison with the problems to be settled by our Earth's civilization if it is going to survive and develop. Ideas which changed the world in the past have always seemed fantastic and unreal to their contemporaries. But with efforts of the engineers, they took real embodiment. Science has given us the tools to make the world a better place. But we don't want to use it because of our inflexibility and conservatism. Is it possible today that continuing to build millions of kilometers of roads and considering a rocket the only key to the space, we are ready to move to the Mars at the price of a one-way ticket amounting to one billion dollars and die there? I do not want to believe it. If this is not true and we want to live, then we need to have the courage to change ourselves, each of us. We did not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrowed it from our descendants. We have to work out this duty, otherwise we will not have any future for everyone. The earth's technocratic civilization will disappear as a failed experiment of the universe.